Hello and welcome back to the Cambrian Virtual Show, uh, the show that we're going to be running from the 22nd to the 29th of May. Uh, we're super excited to deliver uh, all these wonderful speakers that we've got coming to you. Um, we've uh, So we're hoping to uh, arrange, on average, three speakers a day. Uh, guest speakers uh, throughout the seven days uh, will be putting up onto our our, our news feeds. Uh, also, you can go and see previous recordings. So we had a recording this morning, uh, which is available on our website, and is also a great place to check out the uh, other live speakers that are going to be going on throughout the week as well. Um, and where you can find that is that you can go to our website, which is www.cambrianphoto.co.uk. Uh, click on the Photo and Optics Show link, and you'll be able to uh, see all the, the previous videos that we've done and also the live videos coming up. Uh, alternatively, uh, you can click on the link that I've just posted into the comments as well. So you'll be able to uh, go onto that link and see everyone that's coming up. We have also made all of the videos that we're going to be doing for the show uh, a free virtual event as well. So we're super excited to give you uh, all of these talks uh, available for free. Uh, big thank you to everyone that's uh, supporting us and enabling to, to, to help us sort of deliver this. Uh, so thank you for all the speakers. Um, uh, because of this, we are asking for donations and the donations, so all profits will go to uh, the chosen charities, and this is including the local food banks as well. Uh, you can donate on our website. So once again, you can go to our website, click on the show and donate there. There is a donate button on there. And also you can donate with the following link that I'm putting in the description. So you can do it that way as well. Uh, coming up sort of later on today, uh, we have uh, uh, Alan Wallace, who's going to be doing the uh, Astro Anywhere talk. So we're looking forward to seeing that. Uh, but now, uh, very excited to announce that we have Gary Jones that's go going to be doing uh, his uh, wildlife photography talk. So uh, let's give a big welcome to Gary. Gary, welcome. Thank you for joining oh, us. Okay. You okay? You okay? Yeah. Thanks for jumping in and uh sharing some of your uh sharing some of your wildlife knowledge with us so uh, and ultimately as well uh ultimately as well today it's it's about how to get into wildlife photography sort of in general isn't it i think so yeah it sort of replicates a workshop that i do or have been doing in person for a long while so uh, it's sort of taking it into the digital age and uh, yeah it's a great platform and just thanks to cambrian for the opportunity to uh to put it out there no it's 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 brilliant to have you so this is like a little taster to uh, uh the workshops that you have been doing sort of uh in in real life but also that you've been doing them on uh, you've been doing them on zoom uh and these are available uh uh so you can come on to these talks uh through your website which i believe we're gonna uh, drop in a, a link at the at the end of your talk as well so um uh, obviously it's uh it, it, it's an nice thing for you to come in and give us a nice little demonstration of uh, what you're offering but for uh, a full sort of experience of what gary can do uh, uh there will be a link at the end of this video so you can go and have a look at the uh, virtual talks that he'll be doing so um yeah i i think we will um i think we'll jump straight into it gary are you uh, ready to give uh, ready to give your talk yeah different <laughs> for me, so let's see make sure it works <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, off you go then, Gary. Okay. Am I on? Gonna... You are, yeah. I'm sure you'll tell me if it's not working, Paul. Yeah, no, you're you're absolutely fine. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Welcome everybody. Thanks for many thanks to Sarah, Joel, and, and Paul and the team at Cambrian for the invite. It's uh great to be here with you. And uh gonna spend the next maybe 30, 40 minutes just talking about wildlife photography and a bit about how I got into it and uh, the sort of steps you need to take to get into it. 
So a bit about me. Uh, I live in North East Wales. Apologies if there's a bit of background noise this, this afternoon. It's really, really windy over this this way. Uh, the lights have been flickering, which is a bit bit weird, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll stay on it right through the presentation. Uh, hopefully going out to photograph badges tonight. And the wind's been virtually non-existent all week, so uh, wanted a bit of breeze this evening, and we've got it in in abundance. So uh, yeah, finding that wind direction won't be a problem tonight. But I am a full-time wildlife photographer. I hesitate to say professional really because uh, I've been pretty much full-time now for three years. This is my third year. So uh, there's lots of really, really good professionals that have been doing it a long time out there. So I hesitate sometimes when I say professional. So I'm a full-time wildlife photographer. It's what I do. I spend a lot of time out, like you see in the images, photographing wildlife, but also running workshops, presentations, doing this sort of thing, and uh, talks to camera clubs and uh, and societies, but obviously the, the the coronavirus pandemic as such has pretty much grounded most of us now. Uh, and it's a new challenge really for, for us guys to, to get out there instead of sitting down sort of feeling sorry for ourselves. It's time to look outside the box and start doing stuff differently. And uh, so this is the sort of first phase really. So the presentation that I'm doing today is pretty much uh, a taster really of what I do or have been doing for maybe the last 12 months up at Flimbrenig. So a few people watching might have actually been up there with me on it and uh, we sort of took it online, did the first one at the weekend which is really really successful. So this is a bit of a taster really as to what I do uh, and it's it's all about sort of getting into wildlife photography and maybe some of the steps you need to think about as, you, as you're going along. So it's it's not purely for beginners but it's purely a way of maybe improving what you're doing already but if you're starting out how to get started out so so for me as a wildlife photographer uh, i am first and foremost and it seems a bit bizarre uh, talking about photography that first and foremost for me that the priority and the, the passion has always been wildlife and uh, that's never going to change from from a from a youngster i've been totally passionate about the outdoors spend pretty much most of my life outdoors spend a lot of time mountaineering and climbing over the years but always with a camera in my hand and never really totally serious about it uh, until you get to the stage where you start taking photographs and you want to get better and for me at the start taking photographs was just a way of actually uh, sort of a record of what I'd seen that day and you do start to fall into the trap that, yeah, I think I need to get a better camera. The little bridge camera that I've got isn't really doing it anymore. So uh, you, you sort of embark on your first DSLR, then you, you're next to a guy in a hide that's got a really big lens, and, yeah, oh God, I'd love one of them one day. So my photography has sort of built up over the years to, to where I am, and what was a hobby and a passion uh, turned to an obsession, and uh, sort of conflicted with the day job and three years ago I, I took the plunge and thought well you know what I want to do this full time because this is what I love doing and it's getting out to, to wild places like this to, to photograph that really does uh, get me going really but first and foremost I just love wildlife and it's this type of wildlife that I really do like uh, I'm really passionate about photographing birds of prey uh, and a couple of different birds really that I you know are my my obsession really and I guess these little guys are, and I know a lot of people watching might have uh, been down to the little owl hide, or I've seen the little hide photos that, uh, that I've I processed and, and put online. And I, I've got a real passion for photographing these little guys. And these are from a hide that I've got maybe 15 minutes from where I live in northeast Wales, and uh, spend a lot of time photographing these. And the last couple of years, been taking clients into the hide, and I know there's lots and lots of people out there that've got some amazing pictures of these these little dudes. So. Uh, they will feature feature a bit more as, as we go along but they're, they're fantastic little birds to photograph and I, I spend maybe a good part of the summer from here on in uh the virus is sort of grounding me a bit really getting out to to check on them but pretty excited that we're going to start photographing these so i'm really passionate about owls and my number one passion are these guys ospreys i just love photographing ospreys from my early years when I sort of watched David Attenborough programs and survival as it was at the time and seeing this mythical uh, fish eating bird that dropped out of the sky catching fish and carried them off it's something that's always stuck with me and the opportunities to photograph these birds uh, has become more and more over the years and I spend a lot of time photographing them and this has been the real killer uh, being grounded is not getting out to, to photograph something that you, you're totally passionate about. They are absolutely stunning birds. 
and a real, real challenge to photograph by by, by far. So uh, yeah, everybody wants that diving shot of an osprey with the, with the talons out, and it's a shot that comes through years and years of practice. But I, I love photographing birds of prey full stop. Uh, this is a goshawk that was photographed in northern Sweden uh, earlier this year. Uh, took a group of clients out, and we had a fantastic opportunity to photograph this juvenile goshawk and uh, stunning birds. But all, all birds of prey are, are stunning birds. Most recently, spending a lot of time photographing mammals. Uh, it's not all about feathers for me. Uh, I do like fur as well. So, uh, and I'm really fortunate in that I've got lots of places locally. And that's probably been one of the benefits of lockdown for me personally, because it, I've not been able to travel. Uh, so I've had to do my daily walks from home. And it's fantastic when you find a fox den, sort of 10, 15 minutes around, around the corner. And then that leads on to a badger set that's just a bit further down. And this is a really up-to-date image taken earlier this week. And uh, it's fantastic because it's given me a, a new lease of life locally to uh, search the local area. And, you know, hopefully in years years to come down the line, they, I look back on the on the virus situation and look at the opportunities that it gave you to, to look closer from home. And there's so much nature on the doorstep. It's been, been a real eye-opener. But I also love traveling. And I love traveling to Africa especially. And... Uh, Great opportunity last year was to take some clients to South Africa to uh, photograph at a place called Zimanga, and a uh, fantastic place. So, uh, so great opportunities for different types of wildlife. But you'll notice that I do a lot of video, and I'm a photographer, not a videographer. So please don't judge me on the quality of my video because it ain't great. I just point and press and let it record. But it gives you great memories when you get back to be able to sit back and look at your photographs, but then look at the live. Uh, video that you took to uh, to give you a great reminder, and this is a warthog in a in a pool uh, with his uh, harem of red-billed oxpeckers, um, and it's just watching this fantastic natural behaviour that you know you, you start to think, wow, the natural world's an amazing place, regardless of taking photographs of it. Fantastic experiences, you know. I have lots and lots of memories that, that will stay with me from for years to come. And these are born out of going out to photograph animals like this. This is a Cape buffalo. And I'm probably about 10 feet away from the from the head of this, this beast. And it's just looking straight down the camera. And you, you can feel the, the hairs on the back of your neck standing up uh, to be clo so close to an animal that weighs the best part of a ton, ton and a half. Uh, yeah, amazing experiences. And I love the cold. Uh, yeah, as much as I love going to the, the plains of Africa and the, the hot weather, uh, for me it's it's snow and ice I love, and I love nothing more than going across to northern Sweden to photograph golden eagles. So this was photographed uh, this winter just gone, and I think this particular day it was about minus twenty five. Uh, real, real extreme photography, but when you're photographing these beauties, you know maybe thirty, forty meters in front of you, the cold and the, the discomfort really does melt into into the background but what i probably what i really like about wildlife photography and what it is for me is that moment that you can't anticipate it's the moment that you've constantly been watching for but always ready to welcome the unexpected and a lot of the images that i get are, are born out of that statement because i've gone out on a particular day to maybe photograph foxes or, or badgers and you know, out of the blue, uh, a buzzard will go and sit in the tree next to it and I'll come home with some stonking images of the buzzard. Maybe no fox or badger images, but I've come home with something that I wasn't really expecting that morning, a buzzard to go and sit on the branch next to me. So it's always being ready. And lots of the workshops I do, lots of the trips that I do, try and tell people, try not to get too focused on looking down the camera all the time. Keep looking at what's around you because there's lots of stuff going on around the camera. You're looking down a a long lens, a five, 600 mil lens, and it's a really, real tight field of view. So uh, there may be something that's going on 10 feet to the right, but thinking, wow, I wish I'd seen that and photographed that. So it's coming off the camera and just looking around and see what's going on that, you you know, as a, as a wildlife photographer, especially when there's, you know, fast moving action going on, you need to do it. I am a Nikon user uh, and I'm not a camera snob by any means. It's, it's horses for courses. Uh, I've used Nikon from the get-go, really, when I when I first started uh, for over a decade ago, probably nearer 15 years ago now, uh, when I started photographing wildlife seriously. 
And I've always stayed with Nikon because it's kit that I really do like. And as far as I'm concerned, it's it's kit that does the job for me. I use the Nikon D5, which you can see on the screen there. It's an amazing camera. Uh, yet it comes with a price tag. Uh, I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't go out that often. I'm a pretty antisocial person when I'm not photographing wildlife or out with, out with people. So, you know, my money goes on the kit. And uh, for me, I, I want to buy the best kit. And for me, it's a camera that really, really does the job. Uh, talk more about equipment. So a lot of people are constantly asking me, what cameras, what lenses do I need to photograph wildlife? And there's, there's lots of factors that can vary it. And many will say that it's the equipment you use, not the equipment that you use, but the person that's using the camera that produces awesome wildlife photographs. And a lot of that is true. You know, you, you can you can have the best camera kit in the world, but still take the worst photographs because you've not got an eye for it. Uh, but it is true, but you need the right tools to do the job. However creative you are, however good your field craft is, however close you can get to the wildlife, without the best kit you can afford, it can be a disadvantage. So what I always say to people is when they ask me what kit I should buy, I won't particularly say go and buy Nikon or buy Canon. You, you've pretty much got to find what works for you. But what I will always say is buy the best kit you can afford. And it, it's that age old saying you, you pretty much get what you pay for. So uh, it's important, you know, if you go out there and best buy the best that you can afford. You don't need a bag full of lenses. You know, I see people going, I've got big bags, I've got lots of kit, uh, but I will pretty much cherry pick as to what I need. Now, I won't go armed with everything on, on a particular day going out photographing badgers. I have a pretty good idea of what I'll need, so I'll, I'll pick out what I need. So you don't need lots and lots of kit. You just need a few lenses, really, to uh, to cover all eventualities and maybe a short focal length. Uh, zoom 24 to 70 if you're doing some close-up stuff or you want to open it up and do a bit of wide angle stuff medium telephoto zoom lens of maybe 70 to 200 for that stuff that's just a bit too far away but you don't need a big lens to photograph it and maybe a longer lens or a zoom lens so uh, I tend to use prime lenses so uh, from 300 upwards so you know 300 2.8 300 f4 depending on the light 500 uh, various converters to go with them but you know i appreciate that not everybody can go out and buy prime lenses and there are some cracking zoom lenses out there to photograph wildlife so tamron and, and sigma both do lenses up to five six hundred mil zooms which are are really really good a lot better than they've ever been so uh you know don't shirk at the fact of our wildlife photography you need big prime lenses you don't you, you can get some pretty good zoom lenses now that will do the job for you which camera do you need? Again, you know, it's like I said in the, in the previous slide, uh, there is a bewildering range of cameras out there and it can be a minefield about what, what to choose and, you know, different cameras will do different jobs for you. You've got the added complication now of do I go DSLR or, or do I go mirrorless? And I've stuck my toe in the water. Uh, I'm still using Nikon. I, I borrowed some uh, Olympus kit back end of last year and I personally didn't get on with it for what I want to do, uh, but I know lots of people are using it and some really great photographers uh, are using it. Andy Rouse, a uh, great exponent of, of Olympus. So, But it wasn't for me. And like I said before, it's finding what works works for you. Um, most recently, I've been trying Sony. Again, I've probably got sat on the floor down here. I've got a 600 F4 that they, they kindly lent me. And uh, again, that's just on trial at the moment to see if I can get on with it. And it, it does the job for me. So it's finding out what really does the job for you. Take time though, you know, don't rush into something and, and, then, and then regret it afterwards and then you've got the, the drama of having to resell camera kit that you've not got on with. So wherever possible, try and loan it, maybe borrow a friend's, uh, spend a lot of time researching and then working out what's best for your photography needs in terms of photographing wildlife and what you can afford. You know, again, always pushing that to try and buy the, the best that you can afford. But the most important thing is talk to the experts and the experts are on the bottom of the screen. Uh, I've worked with these guys for a long while now and don't be going out onto the grey market and buying them just because they're a few quid cheaper or going to the big boys like Wex or Park Cameras. Stay local with these guys, Paul and the rest of the guys there, Joel and Sarah, they really know what they're talking about and you won't get better after sales service anywhere. So if you want a new camera, you, you know, you want, you want to photograph wildlife, go and see them. Uh, I work quite closely with them. So, uh, you know, Lots of advice and, and uh, some good good ways of push, pushing you forward there. So please do talk to the guys at Cameron before you, you, you know, go anywhere else. 
big thing for, for, for wildlife photography, especially when you're using big lenses, uh, is supporting that camera. Because uh, you go out for a day photographing wildlife with a pretty big camera and a, a big lens on it, you are going to start struggling. Your arms are your shoulders are late. So it's, it's important that we support it. So you need to think about using tripods wherever possible. Uh, tripod heads we'll talk about in a moment because there's, there's various different ones depending on, on what you're doing. Uh, bean bags are, are, are an option. Uh, monopods, I use monopods quite a bit where I'm, I'm pretty mobile. And it very much depends on, on what type of kit you've got. And you, you'll see in the images there, this is the, the Nikon 500 F4 with a D5 on it. It's heavy kit, you know, it's difficult kit to carry around all day. Uh, so it's got quite a meaty, meaty tripod on there. It's an Endura tripod carbon fiber. And it is expensive, but it's, you know, it's, it's carrying expensive kit around. You can get cheaper alternatives. And again, it very much depends on, on the size of the kit. So again, I've got to reiterate what I said on the last slide. Go and see the guys at Cambrian. Tell them what sort of kit you've got. There's a whole range of tripods there to try and find what works for you. You know, the carbon fiber tripods nowadays are, are really, really light. And uh, if you're carrying it around all day, it becomes less of a, that's about uh, a troublesome thing all day. And beanbags on the right. I never go anywhere without a beanbag because they are super, super. Uh, you, you know, you can use them in all occasions. And the example on the screen there, uh, lying on the grass, photographing garden birds, coming down and feeding on the grass. So really, really getting down to, to floor level. Couldn't do it with a tripod. The legs wouldn't splay out far enough. So a beanbag on the floor gets your camera nice and steady and stable, but you're shooting right down the ground at the, the subject level and we'll, we'll talk more about that as we get a bit further on but so it's it has, it has importance especially with wildlife and shooting maybe in dark conditions where you're, you're using lower shutter speeds and you've got to keep that camera really really stable so a good tripod uh good beanbag monopods as well they, they're good as well to, to keep everything stable so you know it's as important as the kit that it's holding is keeping that kit safe and stable Talked about tripod heads, and there's a, just a couple, a few, few uh, a variation of different ones you, you can get out there. I would always pretty much recommend the one on the left there for for big lenses when you're out photographing wildlife. That's a gimbal head. These are super super uh, flexible in that you can move pretty much unaided 360 degrees all over the place. It's as good as hand holding a big lens. Um, the only time you'll ever struggle really is if something's coming towards you and goes right over the top of your head. It's difficult on the gimbal or on anything to get it over, uh, except hand holding. But for most of the time, it's unrestricted movement all over, and uh, I'd really recommend them. Uh, again, you can see the guys down at the shop, and uh, they'll show you the different ones. Uh, Benro ones I use are, are really, really good. The one in the middle is the the uh, ball head. This is a, an example of a Benro ball head, and I've been using one of these now for maybe the last four or five months. Uh, and the, the guys at Benro that I saw at Cambrian's last show, actually, were really, really pushing it. And uh, my, my big concern is that, you know, it's something that couldn't really support big lenses. And I've been really surprised. I've been out this week photographing badges in the evening and I've had a, a 200 F4, uh, 200 to 400, sorry, F4 mounted on that, on that ball head with, uh, with a D5. And it's been as stable, stable as anything. Really, really impressed. And that's not a light lens. So uh, it's, it's an alternative. I'd just be very cautious if you're putting a big lens on it. Uh, I'd, if it's a big lens, I'd, I'd definitely go down the, the gimbal route. But the, the two options, and if you're doing smaller stuff with smaller lenses, these are ideal because you can put them on a, on a smaller, lightweight tripod. Uh, when I went to Sweden, uh, photographing over there, doing auroras and, and, and stuff like that, uh, just took the ball head with a, with a small travel tripod. And then you can go a bit cheaper again. You can get the sort of, the sort of traditional pan and tilt tripods. But they're good to an extent, but you, you, know, you, you can be quite limited on a lot of things. But... If I was looking for something now, you know, that would be the priority, sort of gimbal to, to ball head. Probably the most important thing, it sounds like I'm really plugging everybody today, but, you know, I work with the best, so uh, why, why not promote the best? And I hooked up with Hawk last year through, through Cambrian, through the guys at Cambrian. And whenever I go anywhere, before I put the camera kit in the bag or in the van, I always make sure that I've got my binoculars because they are essential when you, you're photographing wildlife. You need to see it before you, you can photograph it. And a lot of the time, the wildlife will see you long before you see it. If you've got a good pair of bins with you, it really, really does help. And I was asked last year if I'd, I'd try these pair of Hawk binoculars and they are Frontier EDXs. Awesome piece of kit. Uh, 
ignore the price that's on the screen. I can get them cheaper for you. So if you're interested in a pair of Hawk binoculars, give me a shout and we'll sort you out. And uh, But they, they are awesome, really light. And uh, they're the first things that go in the bag before uh, anything else goes in it. Okay, we'll talk about camouflage and clothing and field craft because it is a big element of wildlife photography. If you are going out photographing wildlife at your local reserve, maybe, I don't know, RSPV Conway or going down to the Spinneys, it doesn't really matter what you were because the wildlife is, is used to people being there. So field craft and camouflage isn't really an issue. Uh, you can go and photograph the wildlife quite freely from the, the public eyes. But if you're planning on going further afield uh, out into the the wild out into the countryside you've then got to start thinking about what you're wearing because uh, like i said in the previous slide a lot of the time wildlife will see you a long time before you see it and if you are you're walking out with a bright fluorescent pink jacket you're going to stand out like a sore thumb for miles so it's all about wearing muted colors and not necessarily saying go out and buy a complete camouflage uh, jacket, trousers and, and hat and everything, but you need to start thinking about like the guy in the middle wearing sort of muted brown and, and muted green green colours, just so you blend in a bit more. And there are various accessories out there to help you get closer to wildlife. So uh, left-hand side of the screen, there's pop-up hides. And again, lots on the market, lots of different ones, uh, different sizes, uh, fantastic additions. And I've got several of these. Sometimes I leave them out permanently uh, in a location that I want to keep going back to. So you're not disturbing the wildlife, continually putting it up and taking it down. Uh, great to carry with you if you're in a position where I need to get closer or want to settle down somewhere for a while, I'll, I'll put the hide out. Uh, anyone that's tried putting one of these kids' pop-up tents back in a bag afterwards, it's pretty much like that. So uh, they go up really, really easy, but getting them in the bag afterwards is a bit of a bit of a trial. Haven't you been out all day yet? sets you uh, sort your temper out for a bit uh you can buy in the middle uh this this is called a uh i'm trying to pop the mouse over and show you where it is this is a, a bag hide so this is like a it is basically just a large sheet of camo camo material really that's that's sort of stitched and fashioned to be able to pop over your head so you'll just pop it over your head and uh it sort of disguises you you can just pop it over like this guy has over his camera and tripod just so you blend into the background a bit more uh, you can go the whole hit, and we'll talk about them more on the next screen, where you can sort of disappear into the background with a, a ghillie suit. What I, I will sort of advocate, and most people that come on my workshops, uh, I, I tell them the same because they see them on my lenses, are these things on the bottom, these lens coats. Uh, I keep telling Sarah and Joel to sell them because, for me, anyone that's got big lenses or zoom lenses, they're, they're not a necessity, but, you know, I've had these things on my lenses from you, and when I peel this neoprene cover off the, the lens is a spotless and, and there's a new underneath if you're out photographing wildlife you're out in all elements uh i go from the high mountains to the coast and my kit gets absolutely knocked all over the place but with this covering on the lenses it really really does protect them and the camo does come in useful if you, you're sort of in a pop-up hide and you, your lens is sticking out it's going to be as less conspicuous with a bit of camo stuff around it rather than the god-awful white that, that can make their lenses and, and sony so you, you need to mask it somehow. Why not mask it and protect your lens at the same time? If you don't like the camo, turn them inside out and the black on the back. Uh, but again, it, it just, it protects your lenses more than anything. Like I said, all my lenses are pretty much spotless underneath because I've had these on from you. So really, really recommend that. Uh, you can go the whole hog if you want. Uh, I don't own a ghillie suit, but there are, they are available. Uh, if you want to go out looking like swampy, uh they, they will work you know you you will melt into the background pretty good and proper uh these are just images that i've taken off the web uh this guy on the left hand side uh tickles me a bit he's fully camouflaged but his camera stands up like a sore thumb but uh but the, the guys on the right you can see that they pretty much melt melt into the background so if you're really serious and you want to go out and just disappear have a look at a ghillie suit what i tend to wear i try to look for clothing that is comfortable but will do the job for me and uh, I'm not here to plug Paramo by any means and I, I don't work for Paramo so uh, I'm not getting anything back from this but it's a it's fantastic kit for outdoor activities as, as well as photography but for photography it's warm it's it keeps you warm it keeps you dry uh, but the most important thing is it's really soft and supple so if you're in a, in a situation where you've got to be really really quiet if you're out photographing badges for instance or pine martins where you know the, the slightest rustle will send it running you don't want a jacket that makes a noise and i liken a lot of people's jackets to like bags of crisps 
and you rustle them, they make a hell of a noise. So uh, cool Paramo gear, really, really good. You will get wet if it's absolutely lashing it down. Uh, I've worn it in the middle of Scotland, in the middle of winter when it's been pouring down all day. And I've been soaked underneath, but most of the time, wherever you were in, in those conditions, you're going to get wet, but it keeps you warm and it does the job. Most important for me when I'm out photographing wildlife is having warm feet. I hate having cold feet. And this is a plug because I work with muck boots to promote muck boots. And uh, they are, for me, the best boots out there in terms of keeping your feet warm and waterproof. There is a discount code at the bottom. You can see at the bottom of the screen. So if you're ever interested in muck boots, just have a look at my discount code. It gives you 15% off the boots. They're not cheap, uh, but like I said earlier on, it's what you pay for, you know, from what you get back. And I, I spent many years trying to find something that keeps my feet warm when I'm sat out all day in the winter. And these boots do the job. And probably one of the most important things before you even go out and photograph wildlife is knowing your subject. So, uh, and that's not saying you need to be up to the, you know, the sort of Chris Packham, David Attenborough level, but it's knowing something about your subject before you go out the door so that when you get out there, you know a bit more about their behavior and where you need to be quiet or uh, the big thing is sort of tracks and trails. Uh, and I put this on because it's quite topical at the minute because I'm spending a lot of time photographing badgers locally. So uh, these are the sort of things that I look out for. You can see on the, the top left hand corner there uh, towards the tree, you can see a, a sort of track through the grass. And this is typical of badger tracks. Uh, they tend to use the same tracks sort of night after night after night, taking them out from the set to the, the areas where they feed. And on the right-hand side, it's through, through the long grass into the trees. So uh, always worth looking for when you're out and about, you know, signs of badgers, well-worn tracks through the, through the fields. And, uh, you know, they've, they've been used for centuries, a lot of them. Foxes, we do a lot with foxes at the minute. And I'm constantly looking for fox footprints. And if you're looking for them in areas where people walk their dogs, it's again, it's knowing that difference between the two. So uh, spend a lot of time just working on what prints belong to different animals. And, uh, but it, it's good field work to learn it before you go out so that when you're out there, you know exactly what, you, what you're seeing in front of you. The pleasures of poo. <laughs> I love animal poo. Uh, when I see some poo, I need to know whose it is. So we, we are dropping down into the gutter for a, for a few minutes. But again, it's a, it's a great sign as to what wildlife is out there. If this was really interactive, I'd probably ask you if anybody knew what they were, but I'll, I'll give you the answers in a moment. But whenever you're out and you, you see, obviously everyone sees dog poo in our area, you know, like everywhere else, it's everywhere. Uh, normally in bags hanging on trees, which absolutely gets me infuriated. But when it is out on the floor, you tend to know what dog poo looks like. But when I see other poo like this sort of stuff, you want to know who's it is and what's around. And uh, again, so a bit of detective work and a bit of a revision before you go out can start to uh, tell you what's what. So top left-hand side was ptarmigan. Uh, so that's very fibrous and like pellets. So that's typical of most game birds. So you see a pile of that around, you, you know that there's sort of ptarmigan or, or red grouse around. Top right, fox poo. Uh, anyone that's got a dog like ours that enjoys rolling in it and will know what the smell's like. So uh, you tend to smell it before you, you see it. But again, it varies a lot depending on what they've been eating and this particular fox has obviously been eating small voles and uh, and rodents because it's got lots of little bones in it. Uh, but it's normally pretty compact with a sort of sharp pointy end on it. And then bottom left, it's a lot of stuff that I've seen a lot of recently, uh, is badger poo. And a lot of that varies on what lot they're eating. This particular guy's had a pretty nice diet of berries. So it's sort of nice berry color. And then uh, on the right hand side, the, uh, the poo that looks like currants are, are deer. So, uh, so yeah, it's it's working out, you know, what's around by the, the signs and the tracks that are there. So, you know, it's always worth keeping an eye out and seeing what's telling you around that, that's about. Uh, and then going on from that, I say I, I photograph birds of prey a lot. And when I'm out and about, uh, especially on the mature trees in hedgerows, big, big oak trees that have got holes in them, I'm always looking around the base for, for pellets because uh, owls, regurgitate pellets to get rid of all the, the stuff they can't digest. So you can see on the left-hand side, uh, there's a pellet and the pellets that's sort of been dissected and pulled apart. And there's lots of rodent skulls and, and bones in there. So you can start to sort of tell which which birds are around and what they've been what they've been feeding on. So that's typical of sort of barn owls and tawny owls. But it's a fantastic book. Again, I'm not promoting the book. It's just I have a copy of it. I use it quite a bit. 
Uh, this is The Nature Tracker's Handbook by Nick Baker. And it's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant reference book. So uh, definitely recommend getting a copy of that and having a look through it. It'll answer lots of questions and stuff that you need to look out for. And then trail cameras. Before I go out and photograph in a new area, and I've been using these a lot locally, is putting trail cameras out. And they give you a good indication of what's what's in the area and what's moving through the area. So the, the one on the left, actually, this is a new one that I bought last week, uh, 50 quid from Amazon. Magnificent. If you, you know, you're not so sure about an area and you, you don't want to lose an expensive camera, uh, you can buy cheaper alternatives that are pretty good and they'll give you a good indication of what's going on. And the one on the right is a browning one I use. It's a bit more expensive that and it, it'll send a picture back to your, to your mobile phone. So they're, they're a brilliant investment because it, you learn a lot more about the area when, when you're not around. So this is a bit of footage from earlier in the week where my trail camera was out and just trying to work out what was going on with the, with the badges. So uh, this is a couple of cubs having a bit of a barney. And this is 10 o'clock at night. Annoyingly, this was half an hour after I'd gone home uh, and they, they decided to come out. But you can see photographing badges that the nothing's moving. It's completely still out there. So getting close to badges when there's no breeze is, is really, really difficult. So uh, hence my joy when it's blowing a gale out there tonight. But like I said earlier on, you mustn't look at the places you visit through the viewfinder. First and foremost, everything will be etched on your memory if you just watch. So I'm a big exponent of the whole experience and you can't experience everything by just looking down the, the viewfinder of a camera. But the single biggest, most important thing, if I was asked if there's one thing that you need to photograph wildlife, the, the biggest piece of advice would be patience. The more patient and persistent that you are, the better your photographs will be. The more opportunities you'll get, and you, you'll find that you get much more out of the experience. Yeah, it's difficult. You'd probably say it's easy for you, it's your job. You'd be surprised I don't spend that much time out photographing wildlife, but uh, if people can't get out there, I understand You know, that their time is limited, but you know, it does frustrate me when I go to a lot of public guides when somebody will drop into a hide, sit down for five minutes, have a look around, say, oh, there's not a lot around, is there? And then walk back out, you know, five minutes. That's, you know, you, you might strike it lucky every now and again, but a kingfisher will come and sit in front of the hide. That doesn't happen very often. So the more time you can devote to it, you know, as it says, patience isn't a virtue, it's a must with wildlife photography. The, the more time and the more patient you are, you get the opportunities like you can see at the bottom of the screen. But practice really, really does make perfect. And again, with this actual workshop that I do in person, I sort of, I can see people's eyes rolling by the end of it because I, I, I you know, I can't overemphasize it enough that the more that you practice, the more it becomes second nature. And with wildlife, because it's so unpredictable and can be happening quickly in front of you, the more that you can practice, and these are all taken in my garden, and it's the probably the best place to, to, to practice photographing wildlife. Yeah, you get some cool shots of the birds that visit your garden. So I get goldfinches, blue tits, uh, lots of blackbirds. The, the blackbird image is, was gained, as you saw right at the beginning, with the, the camera on a, on a beanbag on the lawn, just looking straight down at it. And, you know, we've got a garden pond, which is great for photographing frogs. But I have thousands of images of garden birds, but it's a great uh, schooling ground for making mistakes. And it's a great place to iron out any problems you've got with your kit that you don't understand because then when you take your kit out into the field and you've got that fleeting moment when a buzzard flies past you know you're going to nail it because you've practiced it so many times in the garden it becomes second nature when you're outside so my uh, sort of target for people to aim for is that when you're photographing stuff you don't have to put the camera down to keep checking the settings you're actually doing it while the while the action's unfolding in front of you and that is born out of hours and hours and hours of practice in the garden. And it, it just becomes second nature. Your muscle memory starts to work. Your fingers know what they're doing. When you're out there, you, you don't miss that shot because you've got to put the camera down and check it. So it's all about practice. Really, really is practice. Talk briefly about composition. And, you know, when we're photographing wildlife, there's, there's sort of two sides to it, really, about composing images. It can be very difficult to compose an image when the action is happening really quickly in front of you. So if you've got a, a gannet diving or a uh, osprey diving or a cheetah running across the plains, it's very difficult to compose the image because it, it, it's happening so quickly. But like in these examples here, when you've got the, the wildlife sat nice and nice and tight for you, that's the time when you can really compose an image. And there's this thing called the rule of thirds. I'm not a great believer in rules, if I'm honest, and I probably break mo most of them and, and do it, you know, as you're not supposed to do it. 
but the rule of thirds really does work. And uh, I'm not going to go into massive detail, but you can sort of see how it works. Uh, the image is split up into to nine segments. And by moving your, your subject around uh, that point of interest, you can change the, the type of image and compose it into a really nice image. So the, the image on the left hand side with the, the wolf on the rock becomes a, a, an image that's telling a story by shoving the subject across to the left hand side because that wolf is now looking out, out over the gorge. And similarly on the right hand side with the cheetah on the plains, you know, it could be a very boring picture with a, a cheetah sat in the middle uh, with a bit of grass around it, but by moving him across, he's actually looking out across the plain. A few examples from my own images. Uh, this was in South Africa. Excuse me. Uh, these are in Parlour, just around a drinking pool. And uh, they, they, the sort of temptation was to compose the image just nice and tight with the, the four down in the water with the, the mirror image. But by opening it up and bringing in this one, uh, and I called it the lookout because uh, in Parlour are hunted uh, they are they are lion food pretty much lions hyenas will uh, and cheetahs and leopard will, will take these so you know I, I think this guy on the left hand side is probably looking out for a predator probably isn't but it works for me uh, but just a different comp composition uh, red fox in Sweden and uh, this particular trip I really wanted some nice tight images of the foxes because they've got beautiful fur coats in the winter uh, sadly never came in close enough but compose a nice image by popping the fox down in the right hand corner and bringing the, the forest and the tundra into the image. Again, we've talked about the cheetahs just by, by shoving them across a couple of cheetah brothers looking out into the bush. And uh, closer to home, this is uh, probably one of the most confiding herons I've ever photographed in my life. I normally can't get close to herons, but this particular day he sat nicely on the rock and let me compose the image by shoving him over to the right and really, really dropping the shutter speed to start blurring the water, which is something you don't get the opportunity with wildlife because you're needing them to sit, you know, entirely still. But you say herons aren't that particularly confiding, so uh, he was a nice one. And then the little owls. I don't do a lot of wide angle stuff, if I'm honest. I should really do more. Uh, but this was a particular good opportunity. These are the owls down on the farm that I photograph, and uh, this was a, a different composition with the wide angle lens to to bring the farm into the background because they're not my little owls. They belong to the farm and it was a, a nice way to give a print back to the uh, to the farming family for letting us do it and uh, so it's just a different type of composition and into Snowdonia so these are the uh, the goats this is up in Coo Midwell and uh, if you've never been up there they're, they're fantastic creatures to go and go and see you can normally smell them before you see them uh, but composition this time was just shoving them across the left hand side of the image just to bring in the background and this is the uh, the end of the the Carnedi Mountains. So this is Penarol went across to Carned Llewellyn uh, and beyond. So uh, you know the temptation would have been just to get a nice tight tight shot of the the goats out there, but much more pleasing when you compose the image and bring the background in. And again, talking about composition, uh, I'm also a big exponent of cropping your images as well. So you know whenever you whenever I'm photographing, I'm trying to get it you know right in the camera. But there are times where it perhaps hasn't worked or it's worked really, really quickly in front of you and you've not had time to, to compose the image so you can actually compose it in post-processing. And this is probably a, a good example. This is a, a landscape shot and then a portrait shot. And the, the landscape shot is as was as shot and then the, the right-hand side is a, a cropped image. So this was the next frame after this when the uh, the buffalo had lifted its head and just cropped it and taken the, the sides out just to uh, bring the image in, point of focus in the middle, and you've, you've got a different type of image because it's a, now a portrait image with the reflections. Again, I'm always telling people, and it, it frustrates me when I'm out photographing with, with people, that, uh, especially birds, uh, I hear it all the time, oh no, I've clipped the wings, I've clipped the wings, delete, delete. I said, no, no, don't delete it. Wait till you get home, get it on the computer, have a look at it. Because this was an image that was born out of, of that situation where I photographed an osprey and it came in too close and I clipped the very top of its wings off. So like getting it home on the PC and then just cropping it in a, in a bit tighter gives you a, a different type of image. Yeah, the wings aren't there, but does it really matter? Because this is where it's going on. You know, the the uh, the osprey with a nice clear eye, the beak's nice and sharp right down to its talons and the fish, the fish is facing the right way around. Uh, and it works as a different type of image and that's just born of a, you know, a bit of a tighter crop. And white-tailed sea eagle. And again, 
too close to the camera. It actually spun around this day, caught me on the hop, clipped the top of its wings, but by just tying it in slightly, because this is where it's all happening, you know, all the, all the detail with the beak and the, the talons. Uh, good old Romeo, probably one of my favourite ever shots, uh, photographed on Skomer Island. Um, this is a, a sort of cropped image of the, uh, the top of the bird. And so it's just a head and shoulder crop and brings out all that detail in the, in the face, the beak and the, uh, the flower. My, my only criticism, and I'm never happy with my images, I always find fault in them, was the, the flower was slightly out of focus because the depth of field was, was all wrong, but it was a sort of impromptu shot because it happened really quickly. But uh, as a crop, I think it works quite nicely. And uh, a puffin preening. So this is a pretty tight crop, uh, 500 mil lens. Uh, had most of the bird in focus in, in, in the shot, in the frame, but by cropping it in a bit tighter, it's quite nice because you can see the detail in them preening the, a single feather. So uh, fantastic to see all the detail when you when you crop in. And then talked about it a bit early on about always getting down to the subject's level. So whatever you're photographing, it's always important, I think, to get down to the level of the subject that you're photographing. And probably the, the best example I can give you in terms of showing that difference is if you get your mobile phone and photograph another person in front of you, if you sort of hold your phone higher up and take that picture of that person, when you look at it on the back of your phone, you'll see that their body's really, really big and they've got little tiny legs underneath. And that transfers to, to photographing wildlife. So this particular example of a duck uh, was taken right down at water level. So sort of lying on the, on the bank and then looking right down the water would have been a completely different shot if it had been sat on the bank higher up, looking down on top of it. So it's all about getting down on your subject's level. Sometimes you've got to get dirty, sometimes you've got to get wet, but it really, really transforms the images when you're looking right in at the, at the same angle. For example, brown hair, this is photographed on a, on a local field. And this particular day I was lying in a hedge, uh, not the most comfortable position to be in, but to really get down to, to the level of the hair as it walked towards me. And again, it, it worked really, really well. One, he didn't know I was there because he couldn't see me, uh, pulling out thorns for days after, but it was really worth it. So I'm gonna talk about a bit more about exposure and how that sort of translates to, to what we're photographing. Exposure is a combination of lens, aperture, camera, shutter speed, and sensor speed. What is the correct exposure that sort of a million dollar question really and it's it's recording your subject in a way that you want you know everybody's got a different way they photograph everybody's got a different style of the way they photograph but it's whatever style and however you like your images some people like their images are slightly underexposed uh, some like them exposed a bit better uh, but it's always ensuring that the detail is retained in those dark and light areas so there's three things working in conjunction with each other. And this is where I'm not going to go into a massive amount of detail, but on the actual workshop that I do and those that have been on it before, we spend a lot of time talking about aperture, shutter speed, and sensor sensitivity, as in ISO. And they are the three things that are, I suppose with all genres of photography are important, but with wildlife photography, uh, they become more and more important. And it's getting those things right. So you've got decisions to make. Do I photograph in aperture priority? And that there are situations when you, when you could do that. More often, do I need to photograph in shutter priority? And that is probably more of a priority for lots of wildlife photographers where shutter speed really, really does count depending on what you're photographing and whether you want to freeze fast moving action. And then fully manual. And I suppose that's the sort of holy grail where I for one wanted to get to. I started off by, by using these two priorities first, but it was a pretty quick step to get into fully manual. And it's something where you've got complete control over, over all the settings. And it's a nice situation to get to once you're comfortable with it. And a lot of people don't get hurt. They're quite happy using the priorities and that, that's fine. I, I ain't got no problem with that at all. It's again, it's what, com you know, what, what you're comfortable doing, but, uh, those I, I do talk in more detail about. You've also got the added complication of ISO, and uh, that's always at the, the root of all evils with wildlife photography, especially a lot of wildlife tends to be active early morning and, and late evening, where light does really become an issue, and ISOs need to be pushed higher than you would be comfortable with. But modern day SLLs, DSLRs, and the, the new mirrorless cameras, they deal with noise a lot better now at higher ISOs. So don't be put off by push, pushing your ISO. I, I've known people that won't go out and photograph wildlife if it means pushing their ISO over a thousand, 
why? I mean, there's there's some great programs out there now. I use Topaz Denoise, which is really really good for dealing with with uh, with noise. So don't be put off by pushing your ISO. And then white balance obviously can re re reflect on your images as well. So it depends whether you like like a colder looking image or a warmer looking image. So uh, if you're processing in Lightroom using raw images, you can you can play around with your white balance. But again, it's a decision you need to make. Big thing about wildlife photography is depth of field. Uh, that's defined as the area in focus from the nearest to the farthest point of your subject. Being able to control depth of field in your image is one of the most important factors in creating your finished shot. And I guess that that's probably relevant to, to most genres, but with wildlife, it can be the sort of difference between a, a good photograph and an absolutely killer photograph. There's nothing worse than getting home, having looked at the image on the back of the camera, thinking, oh, God, I love that. It's amazing. And then getting it on the computer and you look at it and oh, the back of its head's out of focus or its, its tail's out of focus because my depth of field hasn't just been there. So it's important. And the, probably the, the simplest example I can give you today is if you were out using a 300 mil lens wide open at 2.8, your depth of field would be really, really shallow and isolate your subject from the background. So in effect, your background will be thrown out depending how far away it is, will be out of focus and it will isolate your image a lot better, but you've got a really, really shallow depth of field. So you've got to be really careful the closer that your subject is to you, there's always a temptation, there's always an issue that you may only get the front of the subject in focus and it will throw the back of the, the, uh, the subject out of focus. So that's one aspect. But in the same frame photographed at F22, you'll have a far greater depth of field and the background will be more visible. So it makes a decision on to what, you, what type of photograph you want. Do you want a, a background that's thrown out of focus or do you want a background that's more visible uh, but you know that you, your subject's going to be pretty much in focus? Uh, always recommend using the histogram. Uh, I'm not going to, again, not going to talk in any great, great detail. It's something that you can go online. Lots of your uh, YouTube uh, videos you can look at. There's lots of screen grabs. This is just grabbed off the, off the internet, the histogram chart, which will give you an explanation. Uh, I tend to use a split screen on the back of my camera. Like I said, that underneath there, don't rely on your camera's LCD screen. I see lots of people taking photographs and they'll look at the back of the camera and think, oh, that looks all right. But the brightness on your LCD screen can be controlled up and down. That doesn't tell you how well or underexposed your, your image is. You can, that's just reliant on how bright your screen is set up. By checking the Instagram and looking at the, the spread of the Instagram, you'll know whether it's properly exposed or not. So I tend to keep, uh, a split screen so i've got the smaller image just to look at the, the composition and then on the right hand side i can see the, the histogram as to where the exposure is so don't please don't rely on the lcd screen i always get asked about birds in flight and again i spend a lot of time talking about birds in flight and when i do this presentation in more detail now everybody wants to nail birds in flight and i must admit i like photographing portraits i like photographing birds that aren't moving but when birds get in flight, it's, that really is when the action starts, and that's what you want to capture. And uh, it's not easy, you know. It takes lots of practice, uh, but it's all about setting up your camera right to, to freeze that action. And uh, this is a couple of Arctic terns going for it. Uh, anyone that's been to the Farn Islands, uh, you probably get nailed about half a dozen times by the terns before you get these shots. But it's worth the, the pain and the blood to get, you know, a nice shot of two coming together. Uh, that allows coming into the hide, uh, always a difficult shot, coming straight towards the camera. So it's easy to underestimate the shutter speed requires to freed all movement in a small flying bird. My theory on photographing birds in flight is that the bigger they get, the more easy they become to photograph because their wing movements tend to be a bit, a bit slower. So a small bird flying around, them, just looking out the window now, we've got tons of sparrows in the garden at the moment. Really small, fast-moving birds. I've tried photographing them in the garden. Nightmare to try and catch. So a small flying bird, their wings are moving a hell of a lot quicker than a big bird. So it's all about relative to the species and size of bird. Uh, a kingfisher diving, uh, you know, five thousandth of a second to freeze the wings. You know, you've got a heron flying past that's sort of flopping along. Uh, a lot easier, so you don't need a massive shutter speed. So it's determining your shutter speed against the type of bird, the species of bird that you're trying to photograph. So generally, the smaller the bird, the faster the shutter speed to required to freeze the movement. Okay, the, the big trade-off with shutter speed is that it will affect the depth of field depending on your aperture. Uh, so in an ideal world, when I'm out photographing birds and birds in flight, if I can get my shutter speed as high as I can get it, 
and I can get to an aperture of f8, I'm a happy chappy because I know that most of the time that if I can freeze a bird with my ideal shutter speed at f8, I know that most of that bird is going to be in focus. And especially if it comes really close, like I said earlier on, you, you don't want to get home and the front wing and its head are all in focus and its back end is out of focus because your depth of field hasn't been enough. So by getting that aperture up as quickly as you can, and then, you know, my ideal is F8. If I can get to F8 photographing birds in flight, I'm pretty sure that most of the time, most of that bird is going to be in focus. And then it's just matching the correct shutter speed to that. If the light isn't good enough, that's when it becomes a trade-off. You may have to drop the, the aperture down to keep that shutter speed high. If the light is really bad, you might have to start chipping away at the, the shutter speed, knowing that you might introduce a bit of movement and a bit of blurring in the wings. Again, it's all about knowledge of the species. One thing somebody told me a few years ago when photographing birds in flight was if the big birds sat on something, if they have a poo, they're very much going to fly off after that. So uh, whenever I'm looking at something perched up now, if they lift their tail and relieve themselves, you're getting ready for that lift-off moment and they're flying away. So just something to look out for. Back to poo again. Handheld or tripod. Uh, this is the uh, the big one, really. And it all depends, like I said earlier on, to, to what you're comfortable with. And me personally, if I've got the big lens out, photographing birds in flight, it goes on the tripod. I've got small spindly arms, which uh, once I'm holding that big lens up for, for any length of time, I start shaking and, you know, useless. So it'll be on the tripod. With a smaller lens, and this is what I like about the Sony kit, 600mm f4, it's a hell of a lot lighter and I can handhold that one. So... If you can handheld it, it's a lot easier because you've got much more freedom of movement, especially if a bird flies over the top of you and you want to spin around and follow it. But if you're not sure, get it on a tripod. And again, motion blur. So uh, a lot of the time you may not be able to achieve that shutter speed because of the light, so you can freeze the movement. So uh, you might want to introduce a bit of motion blur. So drop the shutter speed right down and you get a different type of image so you'll get that blurring in the wings but again a lot of the time it can be quite a nice image and then panning and tracking and that all comes down to technique and uh, it's getting out there and practicing it and the big the big one is camera setup and again i'm not going to go into a massive amount of detail but you're looking for key things like autofocus continuous uh, which is I think it's Al Servo on Canon, and I think it is AF continuous on the on the Sony, and uh, I can't remember on the Olympus if I'm honest. But you're looking for that autofocus continuous setting, and then it's all about focus points. And this is where it varies a lot. You know, you, you'll find people out there that can track a flying bird with a single single focus point. I find that quite difficult because it can come off it pretty pretty quickly and pretty pretty easily, uh, and it can be difficult to get it back on it. So I tend to. Uh, Nick and I've got this cool function called group focus points, which is absolutely red hot for hanging on to for flying birds. Combine that with back button focusing, and uh, for me, there's no better system. And uh, I know Canon do something similar, and I know with the Sony, there's lots of different different focus point settings. So it's finding the one that with your camera and your system that works. You're looking for something that will stick to it and stay with it as long as you track and stay with it. So uh, key things to look at: AFC and, and your focus points. And then just a couple of examples, really, just so you can see where the settings are for the, the types of birds. So this is a, a diving osprey. Uh, you can see the sort of poor, unfortunate fish has just surfaced there that's going to get nailed any any second. So for this type of shot, the key is shutter speed. So you can see it's at 3,200 per second. To get to that, I've had to give on aperture. So ideally, I wouldn't want to be shooting it at four. Uh, because this was quite a way away with a biggish lens, I've sort of got away with that. The depth of field isn't too bad. The back of the bird isn't too out of focus, but it's thrown the, the background nicely out of focus. Uh, sorry, it's 300 mil then, so it was closer than I thought it was. But to achieve those settings, I've had to go to ISO 4000. But I am quite fortunate with the D5 that you, you can get away with a, with a higher ISO. Uh, Gannets diving. Uh, now, I thought Ospreys used to dive quick until I started photographing these guys diving. Four thousandth of a second. This is a day where, you know, the settings are up to that ideal. Really, really good light. Four thousandth of a second. F8, so I know that depth of field is good. Everything's going to be in focus. And uh, just the ISO set 2,500 just to, to give me those settings. So, uh, you know, you do get days where you, you get to your optimum settings. Puffin in flight. Uh, Skomer Island, uh, a bit of a project last year was to try and get puffins in the sunlight with the dark cliffs behind. So that nice dark background. This hasn't been uh, played around with in Photoshop. 
this is as it, as it was shot, dark cliffs on a sunny day give you a nice dark background and then the, the puffing flying through a shaft of sunlight, bringing out all the detail in the, in the web feet. But four thousandth of a second to freeze these wings, five, six, just enough depth of feel because I didn't want these feet going out of focus. And then ISO thousand just to, to balance it out, and make it a, a nicely exposed image. Probably the best time to photograph wildlife. I mean, there's, you know, I, I love being out all the time. So I, you know, I'd be out 24 seven if I could. But for me, the best time to go and photograph wildlife is the golden hour. So that's that hour in the morning after the sun has risen and the hour or so before the sunrise, sun sets in the evening when you get this beautiful golden light. So uh, I'm not a great exponent about going out photographing middle of the day because you, you're out maybe if you're photographing birds in flight, especially if they're flying around and the sun's really high coming down on top of it, you get lots of shadowing, you get uh, whites blown out because of the intensity of the, the sun above it. You go out and photograph in the evening, the sun's a lot lower down, you've got light coming in at a different angle. You get beautiful chances for backlighting like this this little owl. Uh, back to Skomer Island. This is a, a puffin coming into land last thing in the evening, uh, flying into the into the setting sun. And you, you know, you start to get these beautiful golden hues and, and different colours on the, in the image. Uh, back to my little owls. This is sort of late evening with the, the sun going down. And uh, little owl again, it's first thing in the morning. So this is a season that we're approaching rapidly, quickly, hopefully, where the, the owls were, they were nesting. This is the, the little guy returning to his nest in the early morning, just as the sun's rising. Uh, saw this one earlier on. This is water rails photographed just after sunrise, in lovely golden water. Over to Africa, and uh, got a, I think this is a grey back vulture coming into land. Again, this is first thing in the morning and then the you know, sort of rising sun's beautifully lighting all these underwings. Later in the day with the sort of sun right above, all these wings would have been dark in shadow. First thing in the morning, photographing red deer, probably one of my favourite times of the year when you get to the deer up. So uh, always looking for the forecast of a nice, clear, cold, crisp morning with, with mist around and sunshine. But as we come towards the end, uh, it's great what we do, but we need to be responsible. And there's one hard and fast rule uh, that must be observed all times, and that that's the welfare of the subject is more important than any photograph. Take only photographs, leave any footprints. Again, talked about don't approach wildlife without knowledge of them. So it's going out there with some idea of how your subject's going to behave so that you don't uh, unintentionally disturb them. Be aware of other photographers. It is a hobby that's becoming more and more popular. There are more and more people out there. Uh, I get super frustrated when I'm set up trying to photograph something and somebody comes and sticks a tripod up in front of me or I'll be photographing something quite sensitive. Uh, somebody walks past and sees me with a big lens and that has a wander over and uh, parks himself next to me and spooks the wildlife. And then be aware of the various laws relating to wildlife and the, the big one for for us is the, the Wildlife and Countryside Act and how that is uh, relevant to lots of the species that we photograph, uh, especially birds of prey. Like I said earlier, I do lots of workshops. Uh, they're all listed on the website, so uh, do, do please take a look. A uh, bit restricted at the moment because of uh, what's going on, uh, more and more virtual stuff, but I'm hoping as restrictions ease that we can kick on with, with this year's workshops and, and into next year. Uh, if you've enjoyed the, the, the sort of virtual experience, uh, I'll be doing this workshop in its entirety uh, on Saturday the 6th of June. Uh, we did one two weeks ago, uh, which is fantastic. And it was a worldwide one, actually. We had people from all countries right across to New Zealand joining in. So uh, it's uh, you've seen the sort of brief format today, and we go into a different aspects in a, in a lot more detail. But you, you're more than welcome on that one. But most of all, enjoy it. That's why we do it. And... Uh, it grieves me when I see people getting so stirred up about their photographs and getting, uh, you know, lots of bickering that goes on. And at the end of the day, we're out there to enjoy it. I enjoy it because I'm passionate about wildlife. It takes me to places where I can see wildlife. So what's not to enjoy? Well, thank you very much for listening. And uh, I've no idea how many people joined because I can't see anything other than the uh, the thing. But I'll pass back to Paul if he's still there. Oh, I'm certainly still here and uh, very much enjoyed that. Oh, I'm super, I just want to get out in my back garden now and, and start practicing. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, re really enjoyed that. Very informative, uh, very nice sort of look into uh, 
how we can get into wildlife photography. Uh, certainly myself, I've, I haven't done a lot myself, so it's it's a nice way, you know, if I wanted to get into wildlife photography, uh, it, it's a great way that I can start getting in. And, and first and foremost, like you said, is, uh, is, is starting to, you know, starting to know what you're photographing, isn't it? And, and enjoying that experience. I think so, yeah. I mean, I'm, everybody's different, but that's my whole take on it. You know, first and foremost, I'm just passionate about wildlife and I love being out there. I'll, you know, I'm, nobody's happy if they don't come home with a photograph, but, you know, if you've been out <laughs> and experience, you know, photographs are great to, to come home with, but it's not the be all and end all. It's, you know, for me, it's the wildlife. But... Uh, yeah, we've had uh, we've had loads of lovely comments uh, from. We actually had a comment from uh, Mark Roberts, Mark from N, uh, oh. NWWT. Uh, just that. wanted to say a big thank you uh, for helping out with the Ospreys at Hinbrenig. Uh, yeah. We also had a couple of questions come through as well. So uh, we had a question: uh, any advice practicing in the garden or and locally encouraging new subjects? So I'm, well, I think practicing is just practicing, isn't it? Really, more than anything. But is there any advice to sort of try and get sort of new sort of uh, new subjects into your existing garden already? I think it's probably the obvious one, really. I mean, uh, it's my garden's full of feeders, and you know, you, you, the more food you put out there, the, the more happy birds that you know will, will come in, uh, and it's surprising what comes in. You know, we're on the edge of town and uh, we're, we're very close to the countryside, so it, it drags all sorts in. And, uh, you know, you just need to be a bit more creative because it's great photographing birds on feeders and stuff, but it's not particularly natural. So you put feeders out, but make sure you hang them in the trees so that you want to photograph the birds landing on the trees before they hop onto the feeders. And uh, if you're putting different types of stuff out, bird tables are great. So I tend to get a bulldog clip and clip a sort of natural perch, if you will, to the bird table, just hanging off it. Yeah. So you for that moment it lands take the photo and then it obviously hops onto feed so it's just being creative but first and foremost they're coming to the garden to feed so it's giving them what they want and you know that tends to retain them and one thing i've found this week is put a bird bath out there when the weather's really hot uh okay really really cool shots of the birds having a bath and a bathe and a drink so uh you know going into the summer keep some water out there and you, you'll be surprised what drops in to have a drink and I think we'll just drop in one more question. Just let me find one here. Uh, there's a good one. So uh, from from Dave Williams from Facebook, uh, how much of your photography is, is hide-based? Uh, it's split, really. I mean, I use both. Uh, I use commercial hides. Uh, I'm very selective about what commercial hides I use as to how they're set up and whether it's beneficial or detrimental to the wildlife. Uh, I use my own pop-up hides. Uh, I use public hides. I don't tend to use public hides so often. And so there everyone, I can be a miserable sod sometimes when I'm out. So I like the <laughs> the, the, the lo loneliness of it, the solitude, uh, you know, being at one with nature. So I, I tend to try and get out and sort of lose myself as much as I can. But I do like, you know, lots of the workshops and stuff I do are hide based because it's more practical. So yeah, yeah, it's, that's that really. <laughs> <laughs> no that's uh, that's absolutely brilliant um gary thank you very much for joining us today uh it's it's been an absolute pleasure uh we've put a link in the description uh to uh to your website gary uh so uh, if anyone's interested in going on uh, gary's uh what well, it's zoom isn't it so uh, a, a zoom sort of workshop that gary's doing uh, there is a link in the description and also the URL, uh, ulr is showing on the screen at the moment as well uh, to jump in into that um yeah thank you very much gary um I'll, I'll speak to you after the live so just hold on i'm just going to put you back in the green room <laughs> <laughs> Never know really when to end with people there. Ah, just shove them off the screen.
Oh, sorry about that, everyone. My uh, my, <laughs> my screen just cut out there for a second. Uh, yeah, thank you, everyone, for uh, watching live. Uh, if you have watched live, uh, we've uh, um, we've uh, really enjoyed the sort of comments that uh, that, that you've uh, that you've put in there. That's brilliant. Um, just a reminder: sort of later on today, we do have. Uh, uh, Alan Wallace coming in doing his uh, Astronomy Everywhere talk. So that's going to be uh, really interesting. That can be found on our website. So if you go to www.cambrianphoto.co.uk, click on the Photo and Optics show, and you can see a full range of speakers. Uh, you can go back and watch videos that uh, have already been shown online, and you can also see some of the speakers that uh, are going to be uh, coming up over this week. Um, if you are watching sort of after the fact, uh, please share the video as much as you can. Please still comment. The more you comment, the more it helps us to uh, share what we're actually doing here. So uh, for now, uh, that's, uh, that's us done. And we'll see you later on when we jump in with Alan. Thank you very much, everyone. And we'll see you later.